Health care, the opioid crisis, mental health, these are major topics of concern and conversation in our state. Jan Malcolm, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Health, joins me to talk about the agency's efforts. Welcome. Thank you. You recently spoke at a press conference of the importance of preventive care as well as continued health insurance coverage for mental illness and for substance abuse. Why are those two things important? Well, certainly the comprehensiveness of coverage is important overall for making sure that people get care when they need it for what they need it for. With respect to mental health and substance abuse, we know those are major public health issues and we're just not there yet in terms of treating mental health and substance abuse on a par with other kinds of conditions. We, so people having access to appropriate screening and rapid treatment and support for recovery is just critically important. So in a sense, the preventive care portion for mental health and substance abuse would be checking it out earlier, getting treatment earlier, stopping it before it becomes a full-blown kind of problem. Correct. Yeah, in the context of insurance coverage and making sure that insurance is covering the services that people really need to catch illness quickly and manage it and have support for recovery. Um, my point there was just that mental health and substance abuse are major health concerns for Minnesotans, and we need to make sure that insurance coverage continues to prioritize those things. You also said at that press conference that the state will continue to face rising health care costs due to the aging of the population mm -hmm. and also to the systemic tendency to treat illness rather than to prevent illness. So this goes to the preventive care thing. From your vantage point though, are we at least doing better than we used to? Well, you know, I think there is more awareness of uh, the importance of prevention. We know now that chronic diseases uh, account for probably 75 or 80 percent of all health care costs. And the thing about chronic diseases is they lend themselves to prevention, either to prevent the disease uh, to begin with or to manage the disease at, a, at a, an easier to treat, easier to contain state. So yeah, we're more aware now of the importance of prevention. I would have to say, though, that when we look at our, the balance of our investments in treatment versus prevention, the needle hasn't moved very much. That's of concern. So out of the a dollar that we spend on healthcare, we spend less than five cents on prevention. That number hasn't meaningfully changed in decades, and that's something we need to continue to work on. And how could we continue to work on that? I think with better evidence of the success that we can have with prevention strategies, and uh, a really important thing is how the incentives work in uh, on the care provider side. So today, Healthcare systems are not rewarded for participating in prevention. It actually costs them money, which is a pretty backwards incentive. So, all of these efforts about changing the way we pay for healthcare, making sure people have coverage for the right kinds of things, that's a really important part of the picture. But we need to even go beyond that and talk about prevention really at the community level, not just at the individual patient provider level. Well, it seems you'd also need to inspire people to want to live healthier lives. And in that vein, uh, we all know a healthy weight contributes to overall wellness, and Minnesota's obesity rate, while still growing, is growing more slowly than our neighboring states. So it appears that something in Minnesota is working, but more yet needs to be done just to encourage people to maintain a healthy weight. That, exactly, and, and the obesity crisis is really a great example of what we're talking about. Yes, we do need to help, to help people make healthier individual choices, and whether they have access to coverage for support around weight management programs, that's helpful. But the even more helpful thing is kind of the conditions in which we live as communities. And this is a classic case of you know, human biology has not changed in the last 30 years. Our behavior has and our environments have. We, we uh, walk less, we use transportation more, we do more screen time and less play, we pay less attention to the quality of health education in the schools and to the quality of food. Um, all of those things matter. So if we can construct our communities with an eye to making the healthy choice the easy choice, it just reinforces that when we wanna make healthier choices as individuals, the way communities are literally constructed uh, either makes that easier or harder. So community level prevention is really important too. Well, and so you're talking about community and this is a theme that, that you've mentioned before. The last time you were on the program, we were talking about the mental health crisis and you spoke about the importance of community involvement in treating that. It's not just the individual seeking treatment, but the whole community. So to that end, you also recently visited Hibbing to see firsthand a family home visiting program that's been very successful and expanded to the entire region. 
What is it that they're getting right with that program? And describe the program a little. Well, family home visiting is a really well-established model where public health nurses literally connect with families, with, with, with moms-to-be before they deliver to help moms and the family uh, to develop parenting skills, then to come and visit in the home with the family after the baby's born to just give some coaching you know, and, and to help the parents understand what is normal development uh, it's just a really successful model in terms of investing in families and kids, you know, pre-birth through their first two or three years of age. That's a classic example of going way upstream to help uh, healthy from families the from the very beginning. Healthy families, healthy kids, and that just sets them, and we know the data here, that it does set them on a path for greater success in school, which in turn uh, leads to uh, better jobs in the future, uh, more stable lives, less stress. Um, it, it may seem hard to connect all those dots back to the very beginning, but I think when we think about our own lives and what has set us hopefully on the path to success, it, it starts really early. One more thing, uh, the Department of Health's opioid dashboard shows that prescribing practices are improving in terms of tr uh, catching that opioid epidemic and, and changing directions, mm -hmm. but the total opioid overdose deaths and non-fatal overdoses are getting worse. Why are the numbers still headed in the wrong direction in this epidemic? Well, there's really two things. First, with respect to opioids specifically, I think when I was here last, we talked about the sharp uptick in opioid-related deaths this last year due to fentanyl. So fentanyl-laced opioids are, is now kind of becoming the, the big driver of the opioid numbers. So people start off uh, probably with an addiction based on a prescription for pain or something, and then become uh, hooked on an opioid and find themselves trying to access street drugs later on, which are increasingly dangerous because of the synthetic, uh, the synthetics that are showing up in the opioids. So the opioid death rate continues to climb not only because of what folks are getting from their physicians through prescriptions, but becoming hooked and then dependent on street drugs and so the dangers. So this is kind of a downstream that, effect that correct. is still being felt in the system. That's right. So that, that's really important on the opioids. The other thing uh, that I, I always want to mention when we're talking about the opioid crisis is that unfortunately, we see very similar trend lines in the rates of suicide and deaths due to alcohol abuse as well. And we call these, uh, this cluster of conditions diseases of despair and disconnection. So again, there are some common roots in, in terms of what's going on in our communities, particularly distressed communities where there's just a high level of unemployment or lack of opportunity that's leading to increases in lots of these, this related set of, of conditions that we, can, that we uh, really need to think about as a cluster of conditions that do have common roots in community. So in a sense, we're back to the community involvement and engagement in terms of helping communities thrive. That would be a factor then in maybe turning this crisis around? Absolutely, and I think that's where you know, some of the community partnerships the, that we have around suicide prevention and around opioid use prevention, we think have, have some positive um, elements to them and some signs of success when we can get communities really rallying around what's going on in the community itself that can that can help to bend the curve on multiple of these challenges at the same time. Commissioner Malcolm, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Thanks very much.